we have uh, Professor Randall Ocom. And for those of you who have not been here yesterday, he is the Devon Moore Professor uh, of Economics at the Florida Uni uh, State University. He previously uh, taught at uh, Texas A&M University and Auburn University. He is also previously uh, the he was also the economic advisor for the ex-presidential candidate Jeb Bush. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Randall O'Connor. So thank you very much for that introduction. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Uh, I'm, uh, in, in a way, picking up where I left off uh, uh, yesterday with some ideas. So let me start out by talking about, uh, oh, that's my name there. There we go. Uh, growth versus progress. This is something I talked about yesterday, and I want to pick up uh, here on my remarks today that uh, typically we represent growth. We talk about income growth. and it, one statistic I happen to be familiar with in the United States in the 20th century, per capita income increased by seven times. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. But that growth couldn't have occurred without economic progress. We don't use seven times as many horses as we did back in 1900. In fact, we have fewer. We're using automobiles instead of, instead of horses, We're using uh, cellular telephones instead of telegraph, and so forth and so on. And Economic growth would not be possible without economic progress. Let me think about a couple of ways that economists talk about uh, economic growth. Uh, one way, uh, output is produced by combining inputs. So uh, if we uh, increase our inputs, then we get more uh, output. Uh, another way to think about growth is thinking along the lines of economic progress, it's entrepreneurship, it's innovation that creates economic progress that leads to uh, economic growth. On the slide here, I associate uh, that idea of economic progress with Adam Smith, who talked about the division of labor and the way it fosters innovation, people specializing, uh, develop new ideas about improving the, the tasks, uh, working better, maybe developing new products. Uh, and David Ricardo uh, had a production function theory of growth in his Principles of Political Economy. Uh, it led to some uh, dismal projections about our economic future. So let me think about these models of growth, starting to think about uh, the idea of uh, the production function theory of growth. Now, if you've studied some economics, you may be familiar with uh, the production function that we talk about. So this is just in mathematical form. This will be familiar to students of economics that Q output is a function of inputs, capital, and labor. So there's my production function. I want more Q. So how am I going to get more Q? How am I going to get more output? Uh, well, to, one way is we could improve the efficiency of our production through technological progress. Q, that is F, a function of, well, let's look at that F. If we could have technological advances, technological progress, we could get more output from our input. So, hey, technological advance, that's one way to, uh, to increase output. And then, of course, if uh, output is produced by combining inputs, we can increase our inputs. So K, capital, uh, if, we, we, if we can invest, uh, we can get more, uh, uh, more capital, we can have more output, and L, labor, and uh, economists are a little bit more sophisticated than just thinking about that as the number of bodies who are working. We think about human capital. So if we can invest in human capital, we can invest in physical capital, we can have technological improvements, then Q is going to go up. We're going to get more output. Now, the economy that's taken that idea the most literally and tried to implement that to create economic growth is the former Soviet Union. Uh, that uh, the Soviet Union uh, emphasized, well, investment in physical capital for one thing. They deliberately diverted resources away from consumption 
toward investment, so we get more fiscal capital, okay. Uh, they had a, a, an education system that a lot of people went through, developing human capital, an educated population. Uh, they wanted to use improved technology, uh, to improve that production function to get more output. We can see how that turned out for the Soviet Union. So maybe that's not the right way to think about growth. We ought to be thinking about it more like Adam Smith, more along the lines of how can we create economic progress. It's progress that creates growth. Here you'll recognize from an earlier talk, Joseph Schumpeter there, uh, and his idea of creative uh, destruction. Uh, and so if we think about economic progress within the context of the market system, profits reward more efficient resource use. If you take inputs that are worth a certain amount and combine them and produce output that's more valuable than the input, the difference is profit. It rewards people who are uh, allocating resources efficiently. It rewards people who are creating value for the economy. And losses, on the other hand, result when we combine resources and the value of the resources is greater than the output, and we take losses. Uh, that penalizes people who are destroying value in the economy. So if you create value for the economy, profit is the reward. If you destroy value in the economy, then you suffer losses. And uh, so we need, if we think about the profit system, we need to think about it as profit and loss. And uh, so here, I, I just have some products here. These are products from successful companies, but not really successful products, so the market weeded them out. I have the Edsel there. I don't, you have to be of a certain vintage to remember in the 1950s, Ford company introduced the Edsel, didn't last very long, uh, was, uh, was weeded out. Um, and uh, uh, probably few people will recognize that computer up there. That's a Radio Shack TRS-80 computer. And Radio Shack was a pretty big uh, manufacturer in personal computers back in the 1980s, but um, ultimately weeded out by other producers. Uh, they took losses, so you can't buy one anymore. Uh, another vintage product there, the new Coke. I don't know, do you remember the new Coke? That was for also from back in the 1980s. Coca-Cola changed their formula. Hey, we've got a new product, but that didn't work either. So now uh, you get Coca-Cola Classic. So if you're young, you know, you're looking, Coca-Cola Classic, what does that mean? Well, that was what replaced the new Coke after, yeah, that didn't work. And uh, and here's the Apple Newton. I don't know how many people remember the Apple Newton also. It was a handheld computer. Uh, and, uh, you know, Apple's a successful pro uh, company, but this was not a successful product. It was weeded out. I actually have that in a later slide. We'll look at it again. And then Google Glass. You know, Google's a uh, successful company, but again, uh, uh, you know, a company took losses. So when we think about the market system, and a lot of times we think about, you know, the profit system, but we need to think about profit and losses. And when we look at entrepreneurs, when you think about entrepreneurs, there are some successful entrepreneurs that we can name. Uh, there are other entrepreneurs who maybe aren't so successful, so we don't really remember them. So uh, we have uh, up here, you know, well, good job. Uh, we think about entrepreneurs, we think about Henry Ford, there's Thomas Edison, uh, Bill Gates, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, we look at those, we think, entrepreneurs, those are entrepreneurs. But what we forget is there's the profit and loss, and so there's some other entrepreneurs, I'm not really sure who they are, other entrepreneurs who took losses, they took their chances in the market, and things didn't uh, uh, work out well for them. So we need to think about the system of profit and loss as we look at the way that the market economy works. Um, ah, there's that FedEx jet. jet. Um, and that's an, uh, an interesting example. Fred Smith started uh, Federal Express. Uh, we may or may not know he has an MBA from Harvard. Uh, and uh, so he had a project that he had to do at Harvard uh, uh, for his uh, MBA, and what he proposed was a, a, a package delivery company that would de deliver overnight uh, packages. Uh, and so that was his project. He did not get a good grade on it. Uh, that the professor who's looking at it says, "Well, this is an interesting idea, but really, for a good grade in the class, you need to propose something that's actually really feasible that you can do." Uh, and so, uh, well, it turned out it worked out better than the professor thought uh, with Federal Express. Uh, so um, 
uh, in an entrepreneurial economy, uh, entrepreneurship opens up further entrepreneurial opportunities. If you look at the way, and if you're familiar with studying economics, we have these equilibrium models, general equilibrium models, uh, and in equilibrium models, all profits are, are competed away. And so there's really no opportunity to be entrepreneurial there. And one thing we need to remember you when you're looking for entrepreneurial profits, you know, you see some idea, here's a profitable idea. It might work or it might not. And that's one reason I, I showed earlier, here's some ideas that seem like good ideas, but they didn't work out. And in a static economy, a general equilibrium, what kind of profits, uh, uh, you know, it's just as likely if you see something, you think, oh, that might be profitable, uh, but eh, maybe not on the other hand. But in an entrepreneurial economy, entrepreneurship opens up new entrepreneurial opportunities. Uh, so I just want to trace one example to think about. Here's the wireless mouse. So what a great idea. You don't need a cord. The cord's not in your way when you're using the mouse on the, the computer. But in order to have that wireless mouse, uh, you, first of all, somebody has to come up with the idea of the mouse, right? And in order to have uh, the, the mouse, we need a graphical user interface in our computer. But to have that graphical user interface, first of all, we need to have the computer, right? And the computer was based on the microprocessor, which uh, was developed out of the transistor. So when you, you look, and what we see, this is just one example of entrepreneurship leading to further entrepreneurial opportunities. The developers of the transistor didn't really have an idea that you could make microprocessors. You know, they were just coming up with a, uh, a, a, a different way of making an electrical component. But then entrepreneurs at Intel said, you know, we could take, uh, we could take a bunch of transistors and put them on a chip. We could have a microprocessor that's a whole bunch of transistors in one. And when they did, so that was their entrepreneurial innovation. They weren't thinking when they did that, this could be the brains of a personal computer. But other entrepreneurs said, hey, now that the, the microprocessor is here, we can make personal computers. We can make small computers using the microprocessor as, as the brain. All right? And so then from the personal computer, other people had an idea, you know, a better way to interface is that graphical user interface, which led to the mouse, which then led to the opportunity for the, the wireless mouse, so uh, the cordless mouse. So that's just one example of the way that an in an entrepreneurial uh, economy, entrepreneurship opens up future entrepreneurial opportunities. One innovation leads to an opportunity for further innovation. So you want to have that entrepreneurial economy. Right. And uh, so, and I <clears throat> say here, market profit provides the best incentives for entrepreneurship. I'll just mention the idea of market exploitation. You know, they, I mean, these firms are, the firms are exploiting consumers. But the thing about it is, the only way that a firm can get the dollars of consumers is if those consumers voluntarily tender the money. They can't force you to pay. It's not like the government where they force you to pay your taxes. Firms only get get income if they can convince people to volunteer voluntarily pay. So I don't know how about in uh, Singapore here, I did notice you have a McDonald's. Uh, in the United States, people are complaining, McDonald's are poisoning our, our citizens. They got all this terrible fatty food, the diet's terrible and so forth. And so, forth. But the only way McDonald's can get anybody's money is if somebody voluntarily says, hey, I want to eat it at McDonald's, right? So the, uh, the, this idea about market exploitation, no. uh, the uh, uh, people pay because they think that they're getting more value back from the, what they purchase uh, than what it costs them. I mean, that's the way the, the market economy works. So uh, we want to have an entrepreneurial economy. We want to have economic progress. How do we do that? And so the theme of this session is government policies to, uh, uh, to promote entrepreneurship and growth. Uh, and uh, so here's a list. And uh, it's not very original with me. I think this is pretty well known that if you want to have an entrepreneurial, innovative market economy, Protect property rights, we need rule of law, low taxes and, and government spending, keep the regulatory state out of the way, uh, the freedom of exchange, stable monetary policy. Those are the type of policies that we want to have to, uh, to encourage an entrepreneurial uh, economy. Uh, so, uh, so uh, 
And I want to emphasize that the profits provide exactly the right incentive for entrepreneurial innovation, uh, in that the profit is the difference between the, the value of the inputs, what you're paying for inputs, the profit is the difference between the value of the inputs and the value of the output. So the profit is the value that the firm adds to the economy through the production process. It's exactly the right incentive for, uh, for innovation. And I think this plays toward, uh, you know, you think about, well, maybe we should have an industrial policy. Maybe we should encourage certain firms and so forth. But then, even for successful firms, you're overcompensating them. Uh, and there are, are further problems. Uh, <coughs> Can, can government create investment growth? And, and you know, we, I mean, we see that it appears that there are su some success stories, and the first lecture that we had today gave a good uh, uh, overview of industrial policy in Japan and South Korea. When you're starting from a low base, then, you know, you, uh, uh, you can adopt technology that's already developed from other countries. If you're a low-wage country, that gives you an advantage over other countries. Those advantages disappear. Uh, uh, as as countries uh, develop, uh, so uh, government maybe can subsidize the firms that are successful firms today, but you want to have the successful firms uh, in the future. If you go back to the 1960s, you know, look at the United States economy. So it was the global economic leader and uh, a couple of the, the leading firms in the United States: uh, General Motors, IBM, uh, and. So, so now let's fast forward a few decades uh, and we see, well, General Motors went bankrupt in the last decade. Uh, IBM, that's eh, still a, 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 a going concern, but in the 1990s, a lot of people thought IBM was going to go bankrupt uh, because they weighed way too heavily on their mainframe computers and, and didn't advance. Well, they changed their business model, so they're back on their feet. But, I mean, here's the thing. You know, if you're thinking about, you know, we want to we want to subsidize firms, want to help out those firms that are that are the productive firms in the economy. If we'd done that in the 1960s, well, I guess we'd still be supporting IBM and 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 General Motors and so forth in the United States. But if we're thinking about entrepreneurship and economic progress, if the, those aren't the, the those established firms aren't the firms you want. You want the new Facebook. You want the new Apple. You want the new Amazon. So if we're thinking uh, in uh, in some of these East Asian economies, you know, you're thinking, how can we develop our economy? It's not by supporting the firms that are already the big firms. You want to have the new firms, the emerging firms, be uh, firms in your, your country. And that's creating a level uh, playing field, right? To create a level playing field, the market does a better job of identifying firms that add value uh, to the economy. So, uh, just... Uh, uh, we, uh, I talked a lot yesterday about uh, the issue of knowledge and the fact that, that people in government, I mean, they just don't have the knowledge in order to be able to forecast what are going to be successful products. And in fact, a lot of times, not only the government doesn't have the knowledge, entrepreneurs themselves. So I've uh, earlier mentioned, you know, I mean, there are a lot of entrepreneurial successes, also entrepreneurial failures. There's my uh, Apple Newton again. <clears throat> and you have to be of a certain vintage to remember in the 1990s, the Palm Pilot came along. Everybody had those Palm Pilots. It was a little handheld personal computer uh, that uh, beat out the Apple Newton. And now, Smartphones, Palm is gone, so uh, maybe a lot of people in the audience wouldn't even remember the Palm Pilot to have their smartphones. But the thing is, another 10, 20 years, there's going to be something else that comes along. Uh, I don't know what it is, and I didn't forecast the iPhone, I didn't forecast the Palm Pilot, but that's where entrepreneurial innovation comes in. I'm just one person. There are thousands, maybe millions of people who are looking, what's the next big idea? And we want to give those people the right incentive. The market system does that. Um, if the government tries to support certain firms, then what happens is increasingly those firms look to satisfy government 
rather than to satisfy consumers. You want to give firms an incentive to satisfy consumers, create value for consumers, not to satisfy the government so they can be increasingly uh, uh, successful. And I just I put up the, the um, uh, symbols for these three firms just to think about that a little bit. I don't know uh, how closely you people have followed General Electric, an American com company founded by Thomas Edison, uh, and has fallen on hard times lately, still in business, but uh, the, uh, the stock market value of uh, General Electric has fallen by, what, about two-thirds uh, since, uh, since its peak. But General Electric was one of those crony capitalist firms uh, that they managed to work the, the tax system so they didn't have to pay any taxes. What, you think that would make them more profitable, but no. Uh, they uh, managed to get subsidies. Uh, for their businesses. For example, in the United States, General Electric is the biggest uh, supplier of the windmills for, to produce electricity. Uh, they managed to get subsidies for those. <coughs> and, and so that's an example of a firm that moved toward more thinking about how can we get government support? And business hasn't worked out too well for them. Uh, Tesla, the electric car manufacturer, that's an interesting case. Uh, so, in General Electric, I can look back and see the decline of that company. Tesla's an interesting case because it's, it's never having a profitable year, uh, and uh, a lot of the income that it gets comes from government subsidies and other benefits from, from the government. Uh, my own forecast, don't, now, I'm not particularly a good stock picker, so uh, don't go out and invest based on my forecast, but I don't see a bright future for Tesla, too reliant on, on government. Uh, and Samsung is another interesting company. Uh, Samsung produces 20% of South Korean GDP. So a huge share of, of South Korean GDP goes through Samsung. Uh, and uh, the other large tables in South Korea also, I mean, you add them up, and, and a huge amount of South Korean uh, GDP is produced by, by just a handful, about eight or so uh, large tables. Uh, and Samsung's had uh, a lot of interaction with the government. I've, I think of the company as kind of along the lines of the crony capitalism. Uh, and uh, so it'll be interesting to see going ahead uh, as the, the close interaction between the South Korean government and Samsung, uh, whether Samsung will be able to hang on to the markets that it has. Uh, it looks like South Korea has been pretty successful with the industrial policy. They're a little bit, uh, in years, they're a little bit behind Japan, which started earlier. But you look at some of the Japanese firms like Sony and Panasonic, uh, not doing nearly as well as they were doing at one time. So it's interesting just to think ahead in this framework uh, what's the future for Samsung? Uh, and uh, so, but over time, uh, firms tend to become more politically connected, uh, and uh, uh, this leads to what Mansur Olson called the decline of nations. This is Mansur Olson uh, in the center in his book, The Rise and Decline of Nations. And the decline of nations, the way Olson saw it over time, firms tend to become uh, more and more connected. Special interests tend to become better uh, connected. Uh, and so increasingly, firms look toward government protection rather than satisfying consumers, and that's what leads to the decline of nations, according to uh, Mansur Olson. Uh, and then uh, over here on the right, uh, I have a book cover of uh, my book that just came out, Political Capitalism. I didn't need to put my picture up there because here I am. Uh, but, uh, and political capitalism, uh, that's what I discuss, is the cronyism uh, that oftentimes leads to corruption, the corporatism, uh, the factors the, that lie behind that. And if that's an issue when government gets involved in trying to pick winners and losers, subsidizing certain firms. So the best thing we can do, create a level, a level playing field. Uh, my conclusion, uh, out of all this, well, uh, entrepreneur, uh, economic growth requires economic progress. Can I mean, we too often, as economists, we look at income growth, we look at dollar figures, and we don't think about the economic progress that lies behi behind the economic growth. We don't think about the the automobiles that replace the horse and buggies. We don't think about the telephones that replace the telegraph. That's what leads to economic growth. It's economic progress. And I far prefer the term economic progress to economic growth. 
uh, and the profit and loss produce exactly the right incentives in a market economy. You don't need the government to do anything more. In fact, it's counterproductive. The profit and loss in a market economy provides exactly the right incentive. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, the appropriate government policy provide a level playing field, let everybody compete on an equal basis, and the market does a great job of, of determining uh, who is adding value to the economy, uh, who is not. Uh, the government doesn't have enough information to really pick the, the winners and identify the losers, and uh, so uh, government support to firms makes those firms responsive to the demands of government rather than the demands of consumers. You want firms looking at how can we create value for consumers, not how can we satisfy the government to get more uh, benefits. Uh, and echoing Mansur Olson, over time, government support of business leads to cronyism, corruption, and the decline of nations. So that's my talk, and uh, uh, I guess we're ready for our panel discussion. <laughs>